get all punches. Oh. In order to understand anything properly, it's important to go further than just surface appearances. It's enough to know that something works, for example the engine in your car. You don't need to know exactly how it works in order to drive it, but if you took the time to study internal combustion and became an expert at it, you could very likely do things to your car that would vastly increase its power and efficiency if you wanted to. The same applies to Krav Maga. You can learn the basics and they work very well, but once you've done that, maybe it's a good idea to look at the engine. Because if you do, then the potential exists to make it more powerful, faster, and more efficient, while using less energy and achieving more. But there's another benefit to thinking this way. By understanding the cause and not just the effect, you are now cultivating a quality called insight. And in combat, insight is crucially important, because it allows you to understand more clearly what an opponent is doing, and how to respond most effectively and in some cases to even predict what he's going to do. In other words, by understanding the things that are hidden, it's much easier to deal with the things that are seen. And on another level, it means that you can do things that are hidden from the sight of your opponent, which is the first step in giving you a tactical advantage in a crisis. These hidden elements, the golden thread that runs through any organized system, can be encapsulated in one word, principles. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, as to methods, there may be a million and then some, but principles are few. The man who grasps principles can successfully select his own methods. The man who tries methods ignoring principles is sure to have trouble. So let's assume for a moment that this is correct, and that just like mathematics or music, that once you have a knowledge of principles, you can devise algorithms or play tunes. Then by the same token, once you have a good grasp of combative principles, that you can move and fight in a way that is not only highly efficient, but also unique and specific to your individual strengths, your body type, and your temperament. In other words, if you're not built like Mike Tyson, perhaps you shouldn't be trying to fight like Mike Tyson. But if you understand the principles that neutralize a powerful opponent, then you can devise a strategy that will still enable you to win. So how do we decide what these principles are, and which ones are relevant or true? The answer is very simple, natural selection. Natural selection is the process by which an organism, or in this case, a system of movements, survives over time. When we talk about combat or the martial arts, it makes sense that if something doesn't work, then it leads to the injury or even death of the person using it. Clearly, certain patterns of movement have survived and are in common use today, and there are commonalities that can be observed and evaluated. But is that really true? Because if things that worked all looked similar, then why doesn't boxing look like karate? Why doesn't wrestling look like jiu-jitsu? And why do so many combative systems, systems that have been proven to work very well, why do so many of them look so radically different? Let's ask a related question. Why doesn't a tribesman in the Amazon look like a stockbroker in New York? After all, they're both human and both are very good at surviving. The difference, of course, lies in the environment. The stockbroker wouldn't have a clue what to do in the Amazon and the tribesmen wouldn't have a clue what to do on Wall Street. In fact, if there weren't other people around to help them, they would probably both starve. But if we remove the environment and look at what isn't seen on the surface, then some things become immediately apparent. They both understand the principle of hunting. They both understand the principle of strategic movement, of concealing your intention, of reading the subtle signs that lead them to what they want. They both know how to set a trap, how valuable aggression can be, when to run and when to fight, and how to use tools to amplify their natural skills. Why is this even remotely important to us? Because of one simple fact, techniques or methods are only effective within specific situations. But principles are universal and can be transferred and adapted to any situation, sometimes with lightning speed. Once we understand that, then what is the most important element of learning any system? I'll leave the answer to you, but I'm hoping you already know it. So what lies under the surface? of the Elite Defense Academy International System of Krav Maga. Allow me to ask you a seemingly simple question. Where does Krav Maga come from? 
you would probably answer Israel and you'd be right, obviously. But in the same way, you could ask someone where they come from and they could give you two answers, their birthplace or where they live. Or if you phrase the question a little differently, they might be encouraged to give you their lineage. And so Krav Maga wasn't formed in a vacuum. It owes everything it teaches to other martial arts, jiu-jitsu, boxing, wrestling, stick fighting, and a multitude of other disciplines that have appeared through the ages. But where did they come from? Obviously, a lot of detail can get lost over the course of thousands of years, but based on fairly reliable historical records and the ability to connect some dots in a logical way, here's one version that might cover some bases. More than 6,000 years ago, one of the earliest civilizations that still offer intact historical records was the Sumerian civilization. Their empire at the time extended to almost all parts of the known world, and in addition to having an incredible level of knowledge in all spheres, mathematics, construction, astronomy, agriculture, law, they were also renowned for their military prowess. Over the course of the next 2,000 years, the Sumerian civilization gradually vanished, destroyed by dramatic climate change in the Middle East that led to deserts forming where there had once been green fields. They were invaded numerous times and their knowledge and skill was absorbed by those who invaded them. The early Indus tribes who traded with them carried knowledge of their fighting systems back to what is now known as India. This gave rise to uniquely Indian martial arts, many of which are still practiced today, such as Kalaripayattu and other weapon systems. Alexander the Great absorbed principles and systems of combat into his armies as he swept eastward, and this knowledge spilled over into Asia and the Balkans, stimulating the development of combative systems in China and the steps of what would later become Mongolia and Russia. The Chinese refined and developed their systems to an incredibly high degree over thousands of years, and these systems were blended and adopted by the Koreans, the Japanese, and the Okinawans. And so various forms of Kung Fu, Karate, and Taekwondo came into being. Meanwhile, in the north, the Mongols developed superbly skilled archers, infantrymen, and wrestlers, while the early Proto-Siberians developed systems that would later become a Cossack fighting method, the very early roots of modern Sistema. The wave of knowledge spread south to Malaysia and the Philippines, where early forms of Kali, Eskrima, and other empty hand and weapon systems were practiced. When Alexander returned to Macedonia, the knowledge he brought back was absorbed into Greek and Roman systems of combat, such as the Greek martial art of Pankration, which combined striking, throwing, wrestling, and elements very similar to Muay Thai and MMA today. This also began to develop in Thailand, just as Lethwe did in Myanmar. Interaction with other European medieval empires saw these skills transferred to dynasties of the Middle Ages. Sword and dagger skills, French and Eastern European fencing, English weapons and war systems, an empty hand practice in Europe that centered around what would later become modern boxing and wrestling. And after several thousands of years of travel, the skills and principles that were used since before the dawn of recorded history were once again adopted and adapted for use in a more modern era. The First World War saw not just tanks and muddy trenches, but bayonets at close quarters, and rifles used as striking weapons too. Daggers and swords were still battlefield accessories, and combatants were taught how to strike and wrestle in a face-to-face -face confrontation. In the early 1930s, the first settlers in what would later become Israel also had to adapt to where they were, using what they had. Through the teaching of several men who had been martial artists in Europe, the settlers learned how to defend themselves and to improvise. Men like Zaev Jabotinsky began forming community defense groups. In 1941, a group of instructors, Michel Horowitz, who taught stick techniques, Menashe Harel, Yitzhak Stiebel, Yehuda Marcus, who taught jiu-jitsu and judo, and Gershon Kofler, who taught jiu-jitsu and boxing, began to create a system that could be learned and that was at least effective enough to save lives. And so, Krav Maga was born. It was a dirty, muddled, stuck-together collection of techniques and principles that later cleaned itself up somewhat, and eventually became a public pursuit around 1957, as Imi Lichtenfeld developed a syllabus, a belt-ranking system, and public clubs where anybody could learn this rebellious teenage martial art that was fast growing up. So, 90 years after the birth of a new martial art, allow me to repeat my original question. Where did Krav Maga come from? The answer? Everywhere. It is a synthesis that has adapted and grown in response to practical needs. Just as you carry the DNA of your ancestors, so does Krav Maga. And it's in that very DNA that we can find the essence, the golden thread, the hidden information that tells us what's going on inside the engine of the car. Even more important than that, 
the DNA of Krav Maga, the foundational principles that give birth to the movement's tactics and strategies, is what we need to understand in order to evolve Krav Maga and to ensure that it becomes more powerful and adaptable in the decades and hopefully centuries to come. Elite Defense Academy International teaches a system of Krav Maga that owes its parentage to Israel, but its DNA stretches far further back, maybe to Alexander the Great or the Sumerian Empire, and perhaps even deeper than that. Our EDA system is uniquely South African, but it was created with one very special characteristic that defines it. It is continuously evolving. Just as artificial intelligence learns to overcome obstacles and invent completely unexpected and incredible ways of solving problems, so our Krav Maga is designed to be organic and alive in nature. To ensure that it stays that way, and is even self-developing and self-repairing into the future, we have a list of 16 key principles that define and codify our techniques and tactics. For those who already train in our system, this is no big deal and it's common knowledge pretty much from day one. But what do these principles actually accomplish? Are they just meaningless philosophical ideals? Or can we find them in reality, not just in Krav Maga but elsewhere as well? One of the mandates we carry is to examine principles common to effective combative systems and to examine whether these also have value to us. And so there are quite a few techniques or more accurately principle-based movements within our system of Krav Maga that closely resemble principles found in other martial arts. We're also very careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater because sometimes very powerful principles can be found in the most seemingly unexpected places. Very often observers of a martial art or combative system fail to distinguish between practice and application. This can lead to a mistaken impression that something is ineffective because it does not look like the finished product. To give an example, nobody just picks up a tennis racket and competes at Wimbledon. A beginner has to practice principles and techniques of movement over and over to become proficient, and it looks nothing like a competent tennis player at first. And even when someone is a Wimbledon champion, they don't practice their skills by playing a full tournament against other champions every time they train. They focus on key aspects of a serve, or rehearse their foot placement, or undergo sports psychology coaching, because they know something critically important. To fully master a skill, you have to fully understand the skill, and understanding means deconstructing. Take a moment to look at these clips, and I'd like you to focus on two things. Number one, the vast difference between practice and application, but with the understanding that both are absolutely necessary. And number two, if you're already a Krav Maga practitioner, particularly in the EDA system of Krav Maga, I'd like you to identify as many elements as possible that you've seen or experienced in our own Krav Maga system. Check this out. I'm going to rotate my body so that my shoulder, my hip, and my foot all go in the towards direction of the punch. So we'll do this in slow motion. And right before, I'm going to extend my arm, my thumbs are facing towards me. Right before I make contact with the bag, I'm going to turn my fist so that the knuckles are facing the ceiling. Okay. Now if I do it together, you side swing, side swing, watch. You to just blindly do this roll under motion. I mean, this is okay. He just he can't get off two punches. I mean, that is a mark of a shot fighter when you can't get off punches. Oh, a beautiful right here. Down goes Bogart. That's all it took. Defense has been exceptional. Danny Jacobs just can't seem to get enough punches put together to make an impact on Canelo. And Canelo continues just to slip punches beautifully. It's almost like a, an exercise in the ring, Sergio, when you say, hey, just slip and hit. Just make this guy miss. But look, look at this. He continues to do so. Il y a une 20-30 ans, il est 9e dan, il ne doit pas être tout jeune, 1951, c'est pas...
C'est pas un gamin. Il a plus de 60 ans. Mais regardez euh, l'impression. Donc c'est une batte de baseball, wow. mesdames, messieurs. Сата вошел во вкус и полетел вперед, насадив соперника. Соперник оказался крепким и достойно держал эти пушки. Но этот цуки в области. Here we have a belly down transition to turtle. This movement can be used to escape side control and it's a useful scrambling skill to have as it teaches you how to rotate the body using the power of the hips. And back to the guard. Same thing on the other side. I set it up like scissors feet. Beautiful transition there. He didn't get the shot but he ducked under and came Gritz is able to mount some of his offense. Thomas able to get him down again. or protect himself from the hit. It's up to him, or a mixture of all those three.
was like this. Just like this. Oh. Counter attack. Yeah. Bring that right hand. Make a bicep muscle like that. Hit the groin. Break out face in and punch the face. The purpose of this video is to point out that no matter what you practice, there are inevitable movements and principles that are common across all systems. And of course we haven't even touched on weapons use here. You'll also notice that hard or innately aggressive fighting methods, such as boxing and Muay Thai, also contain elements of extreme fluidity and relaxation, while soft methods, such as Tai Chi, also contain within them elements of aggression, sudden attack and unyielding strength. By noticing this, we understand that a combat system is not necessarily one extreme or the other. The application depends upon the environment and the opportunity, and this is a hidden truth within the EDA system of Krav Maga. There are generally two types of systems, fixed systems and organic systems, and this applies to the martial arts as well. Instructors who have a fixed system mentality generally believe that their system is the very best and that nothing on earth can possibly be quite as effective. Because they are stuck there, it becomes psychologically impossible for them to admit that any other system may have equivalent value. And of course, the internet in particular is full of people like these. Of course, this is silly, and it's usually a result of ego and insecurity, and the absurdity of it is demonstrated by the fact that when they do change something, suddenly the previous technique they taught is now shown up as being less than perfect by comparison. On the other hand, the organic evolutionary approach is to be open to possibility and to accommodate intelligent adaptation. Here we acknowledge that not everything works in every situation and that the key skills that need to be taught are principle-based. Techniques exist to teach principles and principles can be instantly adapted to different environments. Because of this, it's necessary to define and focus on those principles and then seek out techniques and approaches which accord with those universal principles. And that is what we do. At Elite Defense Academy International, we're not bound by tradition or fragile ego or the opinions and agendas of other people. So having watched this, I'd like to ask you to pick a Krav Maga technique you know or an area of study. It could be anything from simply throwing three or four strikes in a combination to practicing an escape from the ground to using a weapon. 
and to do that technique or sequence for half an hour. However, the goal here is not to focus too much on the external mechanics of the technique, but rather to identify the common principles of movement and application in order to become more deeply aware of what lies beneath the prescribed movement. These principles are psychological as well as physical. If you're a beginner and are unsure of what these principles mean, then I suggest you focus only on these three to begin with. Everything is an attack. In other words, aggression needs to be cultivated. Breathing and relaxing. Are you stiff and rigid in your movements, or are you deliberately practicing to overcome shock and paralysis in order to function fluidly and automatically in a crisis? And bursting, explosive physical movement that is sudden and without warning. If you already have a good grounding in the EDA Krav Maga system, then by all means also incorporate as many of the other principles as you're able to. Training your mind is just as important as training your body. And by focusing on principles, you're laying the foundation for more advanced pattern recognition and intuitive reaction. And this is known in the martial arts as combat intelligence. Adapt this way of thinking and the physical principles to suit your body type and your temperament. Practice progressively but realistically and see how your understanding of Krav Maga and combatives in general changes as a result. <music>